Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami. So as usual, that's a traditional invitation to a Dhamma talk and then the homage to the triple gem of the Buddha Dhamma Sangha before the, the talk and just a way of remembering our lineage and uh, to whom we owe all these teachings. There's a sutta where the Buddha uh, says that what the world considers pleasure the noble ones, the enlightened beings, consider pain, and what the noble ones consider pleasure, the world considers suffering. And this image of practice as a radical inversion of how we see happiness manifesting in the world and how we conceive of our own proper route through it is important to look into because many will know the word bhavana. There's not actually a word for meditation in Pali. It's, uh, the term is bhavana, which means cultivation or development, namely the cultivation of wholesome mental qualities through meditation, through mindfulness, through the Eightfold Path, the Noble Eightfold Path. But I think we can play on that word development uh, for the sake of this talk and think about developing a photo and how you take a negative of a photo and develop it and suddenly everything inverts and what was dark is now bright and what is bright is now dark and suddenly the picture is clear. And this is what we do in practice, is we take a world which is fraught and um, in some ways fragile and falling apart, and we stop looking to it for security and instead look to something beyond, which involves inherently putting aside the feeding off of the world which we've grown up doing. And uh, I'm reminded especially of, um, we aren't allowed to watch TV, but I kept hearing about this Seinfeld episode where George, Cas George Costanza decides for an episode to do everything the opposite of what he would usually do. And he's like terribly happy and everything goes well for him. And I think as practitioners, we get to think of ourselves as a bunch of George Costanzas. So we move opposite what the world thinks and tells us. And the essential linchpin of this polarity, of this switch, is the directive of the first noble truth. And for those of you who know, the first noble truth is the uh, encouragement to comprehend our dukkha, our suffering. And the other noble truths, the second is to let go of craving, the third to realize peace or cessation of suffering, and the fourth to develop the path, the noble eightfold path to that peace. But all of it begins with that linchpin, that primary step of turning towards our suffering and our stress and looking at it and laying careful hands on it. And it's so significant that that's the first step because we have no trouble opening ourselves to the good in life, to the happiness. So much of a uh, sort of vague American spirituality is predicated on, you know, feel good phrases about spreading loving kindness and all these things. And that's important. But it becomes spiritual bypass if we don't first tor turn towards our own. Uh, brokenness, 
and difficulty and stress and look at that. And that is the primary inversion, that is the primary George Costanza moment of the path. Because where we suffer the most is where our self is most involved, where we're craving the most. And this might be with the boss that we wish was otherwise. It might be the spouse who we wish loved us as much as we w think we love them. It might be with the kid we wish behaved. It might be with ourselves and our personality, which we wish was otherwise. But wherever that suffering is coming up in the heart, that's where our craving is. And there, therefore, that is also exactly where we need to focus our practice most fully. And the magic is that when we do that, when you turn completely towards those points, trigger points of suffering, of difficulty, and manage to let go of the craving which is causing this secondary level of pain, of suffering, of stress, where the difficult boss isn't just difficult, it's rather, you know, something that I think about all the time and which makes me angry constantly when we let go of that craving for the world to be otherwise, then there's a peace. And we've, in that moment, developed and used that suffering to develop the path. We've cultivated qualities of wisdom, of loving kindness, of patience. And without suffering, there would be no reason to look to those more noble and stable qualities of heart. We could coast with the winds at our backs only through suffering and conscious turning towards our difficulty does the knowing element of the heart have any motivation to separate itself from the mix of the world. It's like a, uh, the analogy is often given of a water bottle of oil and water mixed together. And as long as you're shaking it always, they're always mixed. But if you let it sit for a second, then the oil rises clearly and the other liquid falls to the bottom and they separate out. And only through suffering do we have any motivation to separate out the pure qualities of heart that are uh, deeply um, majestic. And this is why suffering is a gift. Because without it, we would move through life tying our hearts to this and that and we would never have the opportunity to cultivate the more noble aspects of our character and mind. There's a uh, famous story of Gurdjieff, a Sufi teacher who, in his community, many of you will have heard this, there was a uh, especially problematic member who all the other community just really disliked. And one day, Gurdjieff, the teacher, was gone and they were doing some project, and the person just went over the line, and they chased him out, basically. And when Gurdjieff returned, uh, he asked, where's this person? And they said, oh, he just got to be too much. We, we made him leave. And Gurdjieff said, bring him back right now. I pay him to be here. So there's something with our, uh, our where Ajahn Yanako says that, you know, his practice is he finds the dirtiest place in the workshop and makes it the cleanest. Wherever is dirtiest for us, wherever we suffer the most, is exactly where we have the opportunity to cultivate the greatest compassion, the greatest patience. Uh, another story which is um, relevant uh, is that of, um, they say, the first teacher to take Buddhism into Tibet. He had a assistant who was really annoying, but he'd heard all the Tibetans were nice, so he made the assistant come with him so that he'd have someone to practice with, basically, and develop these qualities. Because when we're given this directive to turn towards and comprehend our dukkha, our suffering, with a lot of things in our life, it's enough to kind of give that a half nod and be like, okay, I'll practice with it. But that's not enough, because with the deepest losses in our life, with our feeling of uh, lack of self-worth, with the relationship which falls apart with the estranged daughter, with the estranged mother, with the death which came too soon, with the illness which we didn't expect. You can't just tell yourself, okay, practice with this. 
you need to lean into the wind completely and realize that that exactly is where your practice is completely. That is the focus. That is the domain where your heart will truly grow. Where you stumble, dig for treasure. And this linchpin is, I think, uh, best, you know, and that's why they're the noble truths is because these are the, in some sense, those big pains we have to bow to. And as we do, you learn to understand and accept them and the noble qualities of heart grow. Uh, and that's exactly why we're here with all this difficulty, which is such a gift in its own right. The best teaching, I think, on this is something called the Tibetan Eight Verses of Mind Training. And it was written by Kadampe Geshe Longri Tangpa in the 12th century. And they go as follows. With the aspiration to benefit all sentient beings, which are more precious than a wish-fulfilling jewel, I will constantly practice holding them dear. Whenever I interact with anyone, I will view myself as lowest of all and from the depths of my heart respectfully hold others as supreme. In all my deeds, may I probe my mind and as soon as afflictions and defilements arise, may I strongly confront and avert them for they harm myself and others. Whenever I encounter someone of unpleasant character oppressed by suffering, I will hold them dear as a precious treasure for they are hard to find. When others out of jealousy and anger mistreat me with abuse, slander, and scorn, I will consider them, I will offer the victory to them and humbly take upon myself defeat. When someone who I have helped and have given great trust abuses me, I will hold them as my precious teacher. In short, I will quietly take upon myself all the sufferings of all beings, my mother, my mothers, and offer to them happiness. Doing this, undefiled by the eight mundane concerns, letting go of illusion, I will find unshakable deliverance. And when you hear those verses, they are enough to steer a whole life because they all involve this flip where what the world tells us we need to do to hold ourselves above others, to, uh, you know, hold an enemy as an enemy, to look with aversion at those who treat us ill. These verses reveal how just those places, if held correctly, with true nobility of spirit and lucidity of purpose, become exactly where we need to practice. And you see this all throughout the suttas as well, is this uh, complete inversion of the photograph of life that the world gives us. So with possessions, the Buddha in one sutta says, when the house is on fire, the vessel salvaged will be the one of use. So when life is on fire, sorry, when the world is on fire with aging and death, that which is given is well salvaged. Everything we keep, we lose at death. All we actually keep is what we give away. This is the radical inversion. And this is useful to remember whenever you have a craving for something, it's difficult to destroy or negate that valence, that polarization of the object, but you can reverse the valence and make yourself give it away. And that's actually a lot easier, is you still click the buy button on Amazon, but you change the address to your friends. And I had a, I had a friend, a monk, who did this constantly, is he'd always bring me like cocos in the middle of the day, and I'd be like, what are you doing this for? And he said, I really wanted this, but then I thought, why don't I give this to Misipo? Gained a lot of weight that time. <laughs> and it has to do also with the ego and giving that away. You know, of the eight worldly winds, which the Buddha talks about, pain, pleasure, gain, loss, fame, disrepute, praise, blame, 
four of those wins have to do with how we're viewed by others. It's so fundamental. It's a biological imperative. You know, if you were a chimp and you were exiled from the troop, you were dead. So this need constantly to jostle for position, um, it's, it's fundamentally in our brain, we're always negotiating how valued we are in a group, where we rest in the hierarchy. They did a study where I think they poured a bunch of orange juice for different volunteers before a, a study, and they poured some volunteers like slightly less orange juice, and the volunteers were just obsessed the whole time with why they got less orange juice. And this acknowledgement of how much the world holds up this, you know, being valued, sitting at the front. And as practitioners, can you go the other way, flip it, give up that sense of pride, step out of the game and sit at the back table? If you're going to do something good, can you uh, do it anonymously? And if you want to speak loudly to be noticed, can you be silent? And the miracle of all these acts of moving counter to what the world says you should do is that when you pass through that dark valley of the first noble truth and the second noble truth, of seeing that point of suffering, wanting to be noticed, wanting to keep, wanting not to suffer, and let go of the craving, you understand where it's coming from, you let go of the craving, the need, then suddenly you find yourself standing in the third noble truth of peace. And there's a hidden majesty that you come to when you pass through that dark valley where, you know, we, I told this story, we visited Dhamma Dharini and there was a uh, seminary, a novice nun uh, named Seminary Satima. And she was, I think she said a few words the whole time. She'd been a Dhamma teacher and we asked why she'd ordained and she said, it was just one more step towards disappearing. But she was not invisible at all. There was a majesty about her, even though she said only a few words. And the miracle is when you step out of the game, it baffles people. And yet you find a majesty of spirit right there waiting for you when you let go. This is the Buddhist conception of grace. When you manage to pass through that dark valley of the first noble truth, turn towards your suffering exactly where it's greatest, comprehend it and let go. You find a majesty of spirit and a grace of heart that you didn't know were yours. When you let go of what you've been clutching so tightly in your hands, you find your palms filled with gold, sunlight. And the... Christian word for this is agare contra, which means act against your inclination, bend the stick the other way. Uh, we say to swim against the stream. But when the world tells you to seek renown, you seek humility. When the world tells you to accumulate as much as you can, you give. And in doing so, you find yourself in a whole nother world. It's like that photograph developed into the opposite. It's like when you are in a forest and suddenly you blur your eyes a little bit and see that between each tree you'd seen, there's a tree of light just waiting for you. The inverted world is beautiful and bright, but it requires you to give up all or most of what you thought you needed to feed off of. And I remember when my dad first came back from his first visit to the monastery in Thailand where he was uh, coming and seeing me, he found himself washing the dishes in, in the house a few weeks later and just asking himself, what would I, how much will I give up to be happy? And that's really the question. It's not, this is not an equation we don't know the answer to. What we give up on this path is all that leads to happiness. They've done, you know, very good studies on uh, different people, uh, lottery winners and paralysis victims. And generally people's happiness set point returns to where it was within a few months or a few years. I think marriage, uh, usually happiness returns to set point in about three years. The one thing that changes set point of happiness or the most effective things is meditation and training the mind. Because if you don't train the mind, you will not be happy. It's that simple. We have one task. 
and a good life and a marriage can be used in the service of that, but only if we keep our uh, orientation of our heart correct and approach it with right view. So I think just finishing with those eight verses of mind training again, because they're worth remembering. And uh, if you need to find them, just Google eight verses of mind training. That'll get you there. You can also Google that Seinfeld episode. I've never actually watched it. Okay, so um, we have a chance now for people to either chime in and just say what came up in their groups or in their practice um, or ask any questions um, that people would like to. So if you're on Zoom, raise your electronic hand or you can type something into the chat on Zoom or YouTube. And if you're in person, you can raise your real hand. And we'll have a mic runner come over to you and say your name, if you would. For people listening to, to this talk, which really resonated with me, but maybe who already feel like they're really low, or oh. who are being abused, um, who you know, maybe hear it in a way that is validating maybe harmful things. Mm. What would you, how would you change your messaging to maybe talk to those people? Very wise caveat. Um, yeah, the Buddha said that his teaching was like a snake and if you pick it up the wrong way, it bites you. Um, and there was a student of Ajahn Chah's who came up to him and said, look, I've been listening to you. To some students you say do this and then the others you tell them the exact opposite thing. And Long Cha said, look, it's like I'm watching people walk down a road and some people veer off to the left and I say, go right, go right. And other people veer off to the right and I say, go left, go left. Um, so yeah, for someone who uh, is already quite downtrodden, um, it's really useful to recollect that a huge portion of this path is actually building a self, but a wholesome self based on morality, on self-worth. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and then in terms of kind of accepting defeat or holding someone who's abusive as the teacher, you know, obviously this abusive is, hmm, I don't even actually think that's the word, slander or, anyways, obviously that's not a situation that someone should put up with. Um, and yeah, I, I'd say just that much that, you know, these are, this is a teaching to be held and applied skillfully like a medicine. And you don't take, you know, the whole, uh, you don't just sort of swallow down the entire can of aspirin every time, you know, like see when it's appropriate to take the specific teaching. Um, a really good point. And, you know, the same goes for the Buddhist teachings on anger. You know, in, in Buddhism, there's no appropriate time to express anger. Um, but there's a difference between suppression and repression. You know, repression is, I'm not angry, I'm not angry, you know, and to the point where you can no longer even feel that part of you. And suppression is like, okay, that's anger. I'm not going to speak from this place. Um, and for someone who's never had permission to express anger, I'd say especially women, um, it can be hard to thread that needle and we're just going to stumble as we move. But yeah, I think for a lot of people, you know, a lot of this path will be stepping away from those unwholesome influences and also acknowledging that as we practice, like we, there's a strength that comes, but initially we can be quite, quite raw and vulnerable. It's like we've scraped off a scab and to really allow yourself to step back from a lot of people and influences and news and things that are infecting you during this period. It's like you're in a hospital. So yeah, great, great point, Brianna. Hi, I'm Scott. Um, kind of going back to her comment, it seems like um, these teachings and a lot of teachings from other religions are directed towards the narcissists of the world and the self-absorbed people of the world who like need to like kind of, you know, lose a couple times in their lives. <laughs> Um, and, and it seems like it's not directed toward those people who are the victims of these guys. So can you speak to that? Yeah, I think, um, great point. Um, it's first useful to remember that when the Buddha defined conceit, he defined it as holding yourself as more as, less, at, less than, more than, less than, or equal to. So 
every iteration and that particular self, uh, self-flagellation or um, self-loathing, which is a particular inheritance of our Judeo-Christian culture and consumerist culture, um, is very much a form of conceit. And, uh, and how we let go of that, you know, that's, you know, the thing is I find those teachings always have, even for someone who's, say, been on the losing end of things a lot, um, I find some of those eight verses of training the mind to still be very, very useful, um, such as uh, holding someone as your teacher, you know, because we have those points of suffering and to take them as our teacher, a stressor faced voluntarily is curative. That's a basic tenet of cognitive behavioral science. A stressor faced faced involuntarily floods the brain with with cortisol, which is toxic in large doses. But when faced uh, voluntarily, it activates a whole different circuitry. So we have these stressors. We have people who are, um, you know, overbearing, et cetera. So to learn to face that as a teacher and to hold it as, as a teaching is useful. But then, yeah, what we do with that teaching in terms of pulling back from that influence and then really stressing the part of the path which deals with building a wholesome sense of self, um, you know, giving uh, the 10 spiritual perfections are all about building that beautiful sense of self. Um, uh, Samadhi also is. So really cultivating that brightness of heart that kind of holds you through all that and finding people who support that. Um, Yeah, I think that's absolutely essential. Um, And once again, that's just something we have to navigate. But but also to to realize that when we really, you know, that really self-flagellating attitude is uh, you're still the center of the world in that one. You're just a negative center of the world, but it's, uh, y- you know, it's, it's, it's not virtuous in the way we make it out to be. It's, it's deeply painful and damaging for us. And, uh, and that's, that's really difficult. So, yeah. Hi, I'm Mike. Um, you talked a lot about kind of renunciation or realizing the way the world is and, and, and what our reaction to that should be, like pulling away. But and Krishnamurti said, it's no measure of health to be well-adjusted to a profoundly sick society. So if you don't feel well-adjusted, take heart. <laughs> and uh, I can, I can, that resonates with me. And but I think the middle way is not to pull away completely. Like I've often wanted to do a, a Thoreau and just go off in a cabin in the woods, be a hermit. But like the Buddha said, like the monks shouldn't be too far from, they have to go get alms, right? So they, sh- they can't be just self-sufficient out in, the, out in the wilderness. They have to be somewhat connected to society. So, I mean, obviously one could become a monk. So what's the middle way there? What's the middle way? <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Um, no, the photographic negative you're developing into, you know, the path is right here. You know, it's like those trees of light between the actual trees. You just have to change the way you see things. It's right there. You know, we're all, Eden is right here if you just look at it right, you know, in a sense. Um, and yeah, that's the point is exactly where your life is. Um, you know, the difficulties, its problems, that's exactly where your practice uh is and uh you know there is a balance between pulling back and involving yourself uh you can compare it to sharpening a knife like if you get the angle too sharp it blunts the blade so if you constantly are working and getting no time for yourself um you blunt your mind but if the angle is too shallow and you're always pulling back and not you know coming into contact with difficult people or suffering or problems then the blade never gets sharp so you have to hit the right angle. And that's why it's essential to have a daily meditation practice. It's really important to find a day every week that you can make your, your uposita day of practice. It's really important to find time to go to monasteries and pull out. Um, I'd say most of us lean too far towards the blunting the blade edge. And, um, you know, and a really good metric for that is, is when you're with people, can you stay mindful of your body? 
uh, can you maintain mindfulness? And as soon as you lose that, you're not helping anyone by being there. You know, I, I mean, sometimes you just have to finish your job or whatever, but um, yeah, I, I think you can feel this uh, with some people. You, you find, you enter after having a certain amount of practice and there's a ability to parse out your own defilements from the person and be like, all right, I'm going to work with it. I'm going to work with it. And then there comes a point where the tentacles of self suddenly, there's no separation and you just, you can't practice anymore in the same way. It's just, uh, your mindfulness is gone. And, and that's when you know the blade is too, it's too sharp, so you need to pull back. But I'd say a really important tenet is, you know, some people have this idea of like, someday I'd like to be a monk or go off in the woods. And that fracturing of their intention of like, what if, keeps them from ever turning fully to where they are now. And that's a really big problem because the only way this photograph gets developed into its, its perfect image is if you turn completely towards it as your realm of practice. And I, I know one person who wanted to be a monk. Um, he went, uh, he wasn't in a situation where he could be, and so he had to come back. And when he came back, he turned his whole practice into embodying this lay life in the best way he could. And he even took the first three of the paramitas as his mantra. So uh, renunciation, giving, morality. How can I act perfectly in this moment? What can I give in this moment? What can I give up in this moment? And he's more monastic than a lot of monks I know. So, yeah. But, you know, you don't need to make any radical changes right now. But you should go to a monastery. That's really important. People don't do that. Abhayagiri, it's worth going to. We do have to wrap things up. Um, can uh, we read the Blessing Braid? What, one final thing is just, you know, with, with people who really feel downtrodden and, and lack that self-esteem, the precepts and the practice are so healing. Like, the healing power of precepts is not, you know, acknowledged always. And if you have that deep wound in you where you, you know, you really feel downtrodden and, um, you know, there's this wounding, uh, just having some faith that this practice is, is very powerful. And you will, you know, Ajahn Sona says five years of practice will get you 50% happier. I think it's true, you know. Um, and just trust it. You know, come into contact with people who are good for you. Um, and the chit of the heart will grow in brightness on its own. You know, you can really have faith in that. Okay. <laughs>